Welcome everyone and good evening. I'm Todd Stewart, ASC's Vice President of Public Art. Uh, and we're here tonight to discuss the City of Charlotte's Northeast Corridor Infrastructure Program Project for the JW Clay Boulevard Streetscape, uh, the North Tron Street to WT Harris Boulevard uh, Streetscape Renovation. Um, tonight's meeting is being recorded. You should have gotten a notice as you logged in, but I just wanna make everyone mindful of that. And then a couple of housekeeping things before we really get started. Um, so if you would all please mute yourselves so that you can hear anyone who's presenting. Um, and when it comes time for you to ask questions so that we can hear you clearly. You can mute yourself by uh, hitting the microphone icon in the bottom uh, control panel of the Zoom meeting. Uh, and if you would like to be uh, noticed, I would direct you to the reactions button where you can use the raise hand icon and either myself or Rendella will call on you to uh, speak. There's also a chat feature that you can uh, access via the speech bubble. This is a great way to uh, give us a running list of any commentary or questions you may have throughout tonight's presentation. And Rendell and I can uh, refer to those later. And then in regards to the public art program, ASC has been managing public art in Charlotte and Mecklenburg County since 1992. And 2002 and 2003 respectively, the city of Charlotte and Mecklenburg County adopted 1% for art ordinances. And that ordinance makes projects like this possible. Uh, is a 1% for art ordinance and it's through the capital improvement project fund through both the city and the county. So 1% or up to 1% of the cost of construction for eligible capital improvement projects denotes 1% of funds for public art to each of those projects. We have, a, we have 183 completed projects by ASC to date and currently there are 38 projects in progress. ASC believes that public art serves as a catalyst for connectivity, bonding people to a place and one another, generating a greater sense of pride and responsibility for places that enhance quality of life and celebrate communities' unique attributes. And we do that through uh, meetings like tonight, community engagement. So community representatives participate and serve on our artist selection panels to select artists for the commissions. Artist dialogue with communities, ensuring the artwork is created with the community's voice in mind. And then further conversation involvement is facilitated through artist-led workshops, such as in-person or virtual meetings, surveys, presentations, artist talks, and eventually dedications once the artworks are completed and turned over to the city or the county for ownership. For further information, uh, you can contact myself, Todd Stewart, or ASC's project manager for public art, Randella Foster, or contact for phone and emails listed there. You can go to ASC's website for more information on all things ASC is doing in the cultural sector of uh, Charlotte and Mecklenburg County. And there's specific drop downs for public art. There you will find uh, documents and a, an ongoing list of uh, current and completed projects that we've managed through the public art ordinance. Um, you can also find calls to artists for upcoming opportunities. And please follow us on Facebook and Instagram at ASC Charlotte. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Randella Foster to do a brief overview of the City of Charlotte Northeast Corridor Infrastructure Program project that we'll be discussing tonight. So Randella, just let me know when you need to advance the slide, okay? Thank you, Todd. You can go to the next slide, please. All right, so just a brief overview of the project. The site is the JW Clay Boulevard streetscape. Um, it's the North Tryon Street to W.T. Harris Boulevard section. The budget for the project is $132,000, $132,818. And that is to include everything that is associated with um, the uh, design through the engineering and the fabrication and the installation of the artwork. A little about the background, the Northeast Corridor Infrastructure Program is a collection of projects selected to improve pedestrian, bicyclist, and motorist access to the Lynx Blue Line. This conceptual cross-section will include four travel lanes with 
four left turn lanes at intersections. It will also have a 12 foot cycle track, a 10 foot multi-use path, as well as of course, curb and gutter along with an eight foot sidewalk um, with planting strip and street trees. This project will include connectivity to the Barton Creek Greenway interface with JW Clay Boulevard. Barton Creek Greenway will provide a direct link between JW Clay Boulevard and Mallard Creek Greenway. This will allow residential areas between those destinations to access nine miles of existing Greenway Trail. An overland connector side, sidewalk along JW Clay Boulevard will connect Barton Creek Greenway to the North Tryon Light Rail Station. Next slide. And this just provides um, the list of opportunities that we shared in the RFQ where the artists may impact in the area, um, where the artwork may be cited. So the first opportunity is for the artwork to be cited on JW Clay Boulevard, marking the Greenway Trailhead near the Walden Court Apartments. Um, we are definitely, you know, in advertising, looking for something more um, linear as, a, as, a, as opposed to something with a wide width, wide footprint, um, something that will be visible to show folks like this is where you can get on and off of the trail. The second option is to um, impact both sides of JW Clay, um, kind of parallel one on one side of JW Clay near the Walden Court Apartments, and the other directly across the street between the cycle track and the sidewalk. The third option is to create a sequential serial, series of installations along JW Clay Boulevard that will be sited in the planting strips between North Tryon Street and W.T. Harris Boulevard. The artists will work with the city of Charlotte to determine the best and most appropriate location for the artwork that they design. And next slide. So a little about the artwork goals and criteria. So we want this opportunity to achieve a cohesive but a unique aesthetic experience that is distinguished from yet sensitive to the site and the surrounding area. The artwork should be informed by the historical and cultural context of the University City area, hence this meeting with you all tonight. The artwork should contribute to the overall streetscape project to create a unified and striking visual experience for pedestrians, bicyclists, transit users in vehicular traffic. So there are a lot of perspectives um, that the artist has to take into account in the design of the artwork. The artwork must, of course, adhere to, to all safety standards required by the Charlotte Department of Transportation. And it should also be constructed of durable materials and permanent in nature, um, permanent meaning last at least 20 years. The schedule we anticipate, and this is tentative, uh, anticipate construction beginning by the end of the year with the artwork um, and, and the project completion spring 2025. And next slide. And so these are just some uh, site images from Google that shows you um, on where the car is. That's the side near Walden Court Apartments that I described in the option one for the artwork to be cited. And then directly across the street um, would be option two, where they could impact one or both sides of JW Clay. The left side of the image is near um, the pond area. And the next slide. And this is images taken directly from the side of JW Clay near the Walden Court Apartments, looking across the street to the pond. And the next slide. So that's the brief project overview, and um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the artist that has been commissioned for this artwork, Matthew Steele. Um, he's a sculptor, he's a designer, he's also a fabricator. A bonus, he also lives in the University City area, so he's also creating artwork for his own enjoyment as well, and so I think that's a special connection um, that will make this project um, even more impactful for the residents. And I'm going to turn it over to Matthew so that he can share a little more about himself, um, a little about his background, some of his artworks, and then um, gather information from you that will help him 
um, to help inspire his design for the area. Thank you. Thank you, Rindo. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here. All right, so I'm gonna show, um, try to show a variety of work tonight uh, to kind of let you know where I'm coming from. Um, and as Randella said, primarily I'm a sculptor, uh, but that uh, typically manifests as woodwork, but I, I really enjoy jumping into new things. Um, my assumption is this sculpture uh, on JW Clay would probably be steel, um, but I wanted to start with something that is definitely not public art, which is this little pencil. This is a piece I made in college. And at the time, I didn't have all the skills and the facilities that I have now, um, but I had gumption. And I thought, you know, what would be neat is if I could whittle all the wood off of this pencil. And I bought a box of, a box of pencils and just kind of went at it. And one by one, just started carving all the wood off, trying to keep that lead intact as long as I could. And it, it took me a while, it took 60 or 70 pencils to do it. And this was one of them. And I thought that the art would kind of be the feat of doing it. But what I realized when I did it was the actual work was recontextualizing that object. Something that we all come in contact with almost every day uh, this simple act of removing part of it changed the way that I saw that object every time. Um, and I think that that's what the power of art can be, to make you reevaluate everything, your, your, your surroundings, the people you're with, um, the systems that surround us. So I thought I'd just start out with that to kind of tell you my philosophy around art in general. Um, and I'm going to show you another piece, which was actually kind of started as a problem. Uh, I wanted to make this piece about home. I was in a show about home, the concept of home. And we had just moved into our house in the university area. And I found the old mantle from the house in the basement. And it had been mildewed and, and rotten by the, the dankness of the space. And... Often what I do with wood, which is nice wood, walnut, beautiful, uh, uh, I cut it into little pieces and I, I have a, an additive process. Um, well, I cut this piece of heart pine up and I found that the exterior was completely rotten and the interior was still preserved. And the problem with that was that the color was all wrong. I had green pieces, I had white pieces, I had yellow pieces. Um, and then I thought, well, with that, maybe I could make something like a gradient. And with that in mind, I thought, well, if I'm going to deal with that gradient, you know, what's the form going to be? So again, the piece was about home. So I started with a simple kind of A-frame shape is my idea and made a template uh, with a CNC router. You'll notice a lot of my processes, um, I'm, I'm doing a lot of handmade stuff, conventional woodwork, but I'll often integrate technology. Uh, I have a background as a graphic designer um, and that's kind of omnipresent in my work. So here you see me making the template on the left, cutting this template out of foam. And then on the right, all those little A-frame pieces fit into that template. And there you can start to see that gradient on the left side, you see all the greens, and then towards the top, it's, it's a little more conventional pine. And by the right, that was the center of that old mantle, um, which is the nice pristine wood. So this was the result of that piece, continuum. And it was really about the relative nature of home, how that changes over time. Um, I want to show a piece I made in 2015 at Goodyear Arts. It was a... Um, the first iteration of Goodyear Arts, I came right after Todd. Uh, he warmed it up for me. Um, they tasked me with filling this 2,000 square foot uh, service bay at a Goodyear tire, uh, tire service station. Um, 
and I, we could use anything in there. And the building itself was disposable because it was going to be torn down. So at the time I was making small benchtop work and I didn't know what I was going to do, but I did look into the, into the next room, which was filled with the old tire racks that would hold those tires. Um, and that, that was on the table. So I thought well, I could fill this space. The problem was the space. How do I fill this space with the material here? Uh, so I made this little mock-up um, kind of showing how I could do that and actually punching through the wall into the, into the tire showroom to support the piece itself. I really made this whole thing with a, a sawzall, a grinder, and an impact driver. Um, I made it right in the, in the bay. I used all the old bolts from the shelves and just sort of pieced it together there on the floor. And right now what you're looking at on the right-hand side is, is actually the left and right side, uh, one on top of the other. And they're hinged on the top like a book. So in this left image, you can see a group of friends and I lifting it up off the ground and then on the right hand side, that's us opening it up like that book with the hinge on top. And we had cut a hole in the wall and we just stuck it right in there. And uh, it, was, it was such a great example of the parameters of a project. Some would say the problem of a project really becoming its strength is in finding uh, the, the right solution for that circumstance. Uh, more recently, in 2020, I was asked to do my first public art project, and it was for Charlotte Skin and Laser. Um, they, uh, they had a pretty specific vision of like what they wanted, which was a face. Um, and I don't typically do a lot of anatomical work, uh, but it was such a great opportunity, I knew I needed to figure out a way to do it. So with that with that background in design, I, I have some tools at my disposal um, that allow me to sort of jump into a new medium with, with, some, with some power. Uh, and, and I'm always anxious and like, I'm always excited to work with people that can really push my work and, and offer me a solution that I didn't know was available. And that will be a big project, part of this project too, is, is collaborating with, with other experts. Um, Charlotte Skin and Laser had this specific space in mind, which was on the wall. And this is about three stories up from the parking lot. And they had this really interesting little alcove um, that, you know, was sort of a something I needed to work around and make things a little more complicated. But I realized that alcove would allow me to create something that appeared to have a lot more volume uh, in a, with a with smaller surface area than than I could otherwise. So this was the initial um, kind of mock up we made for for that face, um, and a lot of attention was paid to ensuring that it didn't feel like there was one specific race in mind. We we did a lot of research into like what features are universal. What, what's going to make sure people understand that this is not specifically for one group of people or another. And I thought that was really important. Um, so after that, after we made that mock-up and cut all the pieces out of dye bond, which is a, an aluminum plastic composite, um, we had them painted by Fine Grit, uh, Katie Schindler. She's a good friend of ours. And this was the hardest thing she's ever done. She'll still tell you that. Uh, this coating um, will last <laughs> longer than all of us. Uh, but the whole thing showed up in one truck uh, like this. And on the right, you see my wife, Susan. Uh, we put the whole thing together in chunks in Hodges Taylor. They were in a, a transitional phase, so we had access to the facilities. Um, but we put everything together by hand. Uh, there were 10,000 fasteners that needed to be used to uh, keep everything into chunks. Um, so on the top left, you'll see like the concept image, the right, the, the kind of more the technical image. On the left, you see these chunks kind of down in the parking lot as we uh, lifted them into place. Um, the whole project... Uh, I think was a was one year. 
So the, the planning phase, fabrication, everything came together in one year. And this was, uh, COVID happened in the middle of that. So it's a really interesting project. <laughs> uh, there's the finished piece. So I'll go back to that design background a little bit. Um, uh, pretty recently I've been, I've been into kind of more procedurally generated work. So uh, pieces and imagery that kind of make themselves. And to do that, I'll, I'll use physics simulations in 3D, uh, 3D fabricating programs. So like Google SketchUp. Um, so what you're seeing here is sort of uh, me giving an object characteristics like, like gravity and letting it drape onto things. And uh, these, <laughs> these have a way of creating something that I couldn't myself and never would because there's, there's sort of chance and uh, things involved. Um, these resulted in some pieces uh, I showed at um, Winthrop University this year. Um, and that process, so these are actually drawn with a CNC router. So the same machine I used to cut that template, I hooked up a pencil or a pen to it and it would make these drawings for me. Um, that has led to some other ideas. This is a piece I did for Honeywell this year, um, last year, I should say. Uh, and instead of drawing, I had a CNC router actually etch uh, painted acrylic panels um, to create something that still kind of has this energy of drawing, but, but has a dimensionality to it that you, you couldn't really get any other way. Um, and this is another piece uh, I finished for Honeywell in 2022. There's actually a pair of these. They gave me a really interesting challenge, which was, you know, Honeywell has its fingers and everything. They have, they make widgets, all kinds of widgets from, you know, thermostats in your house to jet engines and, and aerospace technology. So they wanted something that was representational of their catalog, but not necessarily recognizable. And, and that simple statement kind of broke my brain for a while. Like how do you, how can it be representational but not recognizable? Um, but what I, what I found was, you know, I could, I could create something that felt like a turbine, um, which is beautiful in its own right, but I can interpret that and give it, put my own spin on it. You might not walk into this room and say there's a turbine, but um, once you have that knowledge, you know exactly what it is. Uh, so here's a little close up on that. So there were two of these. These are seven foot discs, all made out of walnut, uh, constructed pretty similarly to the first piece that I showed you. And I think that's it for me. Um, I've got some questions. I'm just going to kind of put them up one by one. Um, but I also will let everybody know if you do have a specific question that isn't isn't up right now i'm happy to answer that question okay so our first question uh what are some significant pieces i'm sorry i can't see what are some significant pieces of history associated with this neighborhood personal or otherwise and if you're comfortable i, I mean i would like to encourage everyone to to speak and share i mean uh like i said Randell and I are trying to monitor uh, the chat, what everyone's doing. So if you feel more comfortable putting it in the chat, please, by all means, do so. We'll look out for that. But uh, to really spur the conversation and keep dialogue going, if any of you feel comfortable unmuting yourselves and speaking, that's always a great way to start a conversation. Has anyone lived in this neighborhood or this area for an extended period of time? Maybe two years. All 
Jalen Kurtz, 32 years on Caroline Lane. It's quite a while. So if you don't mind, and you can just you can just say it too, like um, do you have any – would you mind sharing some of your personal history of the neighborhood, like how you've seen it change, anything significant that you've seen that's remained constant through those 32 years on Caroline Lane? Good to go. Susan, you can just tell us if you like. <laughs> okay. You are unmuted. We can hear yeah, you. Yeah, we can hear you. So I think you muted yourself. <laughs> Now can you unmute? Yeah, you're when we moved out here, it was very rural and uh, it wouldn't be unusual to see people riding horses down our street. Um, we didn't even have garbage pickup or city lights. And we remember the Green Acres nursing home right across from uh, University Place. Huge oak trees over there. And my husband worked at IBM. He said they didn't even have a road. Yeah, WT Harris Boulevard used to dead end. So I'm fairly new-ish in terms of the 32 years. I've been in University City for maybe 10 years. Um, worked at UNC Charlotte, now at University City Partners. And one thing that comes up a lot in conversations with colleagues and community members that we interact with is there isn't a clear sense of what University City is outside of UNC Charlotte. So it would be great to have a lot more public art that is a character base that is uh, bringing different touches to the area that doesn't just exclusively celebrate the university, but celebrates uh, the general area collectively. So um, not from a hist history perspective or historical perspective, but um, that's just some general comments that I pick up quite a bit from community members. Thank you, that's great. I think questions like this are important because um, I think some almost cliche things you hear about Charlotte is there's it's hard to run into someone who's from Charlotte. There's a lot of transplants, transplants. Um, and often when we bring artists in uh, to really try to dig deep, do some research, um, figure out like a symbol, an image, a form that they can latch onto, um, that can be challenging. Uh, Trees come up quite often, um, and we got a lot of tree art here in Charlotte. But to your point, Jordan, like how can we really tap into the character, the identity of University City, perhaps outside of the university? Like what what is there there? What would people associate with this area beyond that? I promise not to make a tree, Todd. I mean, you work with wood a lot, so. Uh, I agree that that the university area never has really felt like it had an identity. I've lived here for 20 years, and I've just seen it grow with more congestion, but it hasn't grown in community, I don't think. And I've 
for most of those 20 years worked right on J.W. Clay. I've now retired, so I'm not over there, but I was there every single day. And, you know, that that pond was the thing that, I don't know, made it felt like home. I mean, I was working over there, so that was, but it felt, it was like, it felt like the central part of this area, more so than, than the university, but my, that might have made, because it was the proximity to 85, the proximity to, to Harris, it just, you know, the whole, that whole area felt like that was university, except for the actual college property, but it, there's not anything that makes it identify. So yeah, it would, would be so great to have such an amazing piece of art that, that could kind of be the logo for this area or the, the identity feature for the university area, because I don't think we really have one. Yeah. Thank you, Meg. Matt, maybe you could share some of your other questions and yeah, you bet. see if the conversation can go on from there. I think we answered that question. Um, it's pretty open-ended. Um, what are you most excited about regarding this project? Um, for me, I'm excited that you are invested in this area because you live here, you work here. And so to mix point, what is the identity of University City? Having a creative help define that who is connected to the community is vital. And I think it's very imperative as um the work that I do with my organization as we look through that lens of what is culture and character and our focus is to tap back into the community that lives, work, learns, plays here because they have that vested interest. So I, I'm most excited about the fact that you're familiar with the area and you're committed and you're plugged in and tuned in. Yeah, I'm accountable. I'm going to I'm going to see this thing a lot. So I don't want to, you know, hide my face every time I walk by. I mean, I will carry a bag of tomatoes if I need to. <laughs> <laughs> one, one thing that I think about, um, so I used to live in a university area um, right after I graduated from college in 97. And yes, I do remember that my father still lives in the university area from Mallard, it's more off of Prosperity Church Road, but in that area, um, I do remember being very rural, but also I've seen the growth of the area, which I know has mentioned before, and also the diversity um, of residents. <clears throat> so I think for me, when I travel there, you know, up there to, to visit my father, um, makes me excited about the opportunity of something that possibly speaks to growth and um, history as well as diversity, you know, of the community. And I think your work is really um, gorgeous. So very excited about that. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm, I am, um, we, I think it is the most, I think it is the most diverse neighborhood in Charlotte, demographically. Um, and I think that that's, I think that that is important. I think that that is the strength of this neighborhood, um, and something that like I'm 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 aware of, and uh, I think is a, is a pretty fertile ground for the basis of some work here. So thank you for that comment. You're welcome. Am I able to be heard? Yeah. We can hear you, Paul. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I. so I've been from Charlotte since I was like nine. So that's got to be like 16 years at this point, maybe 17. Um, and I, I think a project like this is really important on a lot of levels just because I feel like, like you all were saying, 
with Charlotte being such a place that people gravitate towards, whether it's through the banking, through the arts, through culture, cuisine, all the different elements that uh, have gravitated uh, many different backgrounds and people to here. Uh, just in my experience, and then even just lack thereof, uh, university just tends to be one of those places that it, it just, it feels like from an outsider's perspective, like there's really like, what's the culture there? Besides it being like a university or a lot of the amenities that you need, or maybe the light rail happens to go through there. So it's helping, you know, Charlotte. So I think one of the elements that's going to be really amazing about this is finding that key point, the diversity that you're talking about, or the areas, or um, a lot of the amazing history behind Charlotte that's still, I think, prevalent in a lot of areas like that, and then keying in on that, that people will be able to see and appreciate rather than just think, oh, it's, it's just university area, right? Um, so I think a project like this is going to be really fascinating to follow and uh, uh, continue to help uh, Charlotteans uh, see a lot more of Charlotte for what it is and not what it's becoming, per se, which is almost in tandem because of the, the charm that a lot of places have breathed life into. Um, I've noticed a lot of issues with that in the past with like, oh, it's an amazing old building that could have been renovated and maintained the history here. But um, I love seeing efforts like this where people continue to see the worth in a place like that and develop on it uh, further. So appreciate it. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, no problem. I moved to the uh, university area about 12 years ago. Um, I actually live probably not too far from your, your father, Krista. Um, I live in right off... Uh, Prosperity Church Road. And um, what I like about the area is that I, you know, I work uptown. So I like being able to escape uptown and come to a more, um, it feels like suburbia because I grew up in Long Island, New York. So it sort of feels like getting away from the city and being, you know, more like in the suburbs. But I think what defines the character of, of places a lot is um, the walkability, you know? And I, and I think particularly for this particular project, uh, it's in a very visible area. Um, it's in an area where people can walk a lot. And I think there's a lot of promise um, down the line as you see more walkable spaces where people can um, walk to these spaces and, and gather and, and um, commune, um, I would like to see some, um, <clears throat> some murals and things like that incorporated into this uh, area too. So um, this is a great start and um, it's great to see someone who's so invested in it. So kudos to you, Matt. <clears throat> oh, well, thank you very much. And uh I'm not your guy for murals, but I'll see what I can do. I'll talk to some people. <laughs> awesome. Uh, do we maybe want to try another question? Yeah, let's move on to another one. All right, let's see what we got next. Um, how do you think art might enhance or complement the site? So that area on JW Clay that you're focused on leads directly to what I call the big box district of University City. Um, you start seeing a lot more of those uh, shopping centers, strip malls, um, and hitting towards some of the more congested areas. Um, I, I think it complements the site in that the improvements in mobility that we're working towards in University City, adding the bike lanes, kind of creating moments of pause for people to not just have University City be transactional, I'm coming in and I'm leaving out, but to come in and stay and explore. Um, I think that's definitely gonna help. And it, I, I like the idea of it being close to the Greenway um, because you have a lot of activities happening around there. It's quite active in terms of bikers and walkers. 
Um, but there's not much that goes on in the Greenway space in University City outside of maybe some seating. You might have some picnic tables you come across, but there's not really any art that is captivating and keeping people plugged in outside of Mother Nature, of course. Um, so I, I think that it creates a, a very intentional moment of pause for people. Absolutely. I think art can do that. Does anyone here tonight, do you guys use the Greenway often throughout this area, like Barton Creek, Mallard Creek? I uh, use the one off of uh, Independence, but not, I, I live in Noda, but I don't necessarily go down that way. But now that I bike a lot more, I'd be, if I knew there was a lot more, uh, areas for that which i had no idea i'd be i knew of a couple of parks for sure to do like you know uh like frisbee golf and whatnot but uh haven't actually explored further than that so i will say that i use the greenway almost every day i ride my bike to work um and we are right on top of it and we feel super lucky to have it i mean it's uh it adds so much utility to my life, but also it's it's such a it's such a beautiful, well-preserved greenway. We're, we're we're very very lucky, and it's a it's it's a lot better than uh, starting your day driving on University City Boulevard. <laughs> I've oh, tell me about it. I'll have to check it out. Got a couple more questions. I can, I can go ahead. I feel like we've, we've kind of covered this. Um, <clears throat> what do you hope to experience from the art? And then how do you hope to experience the art? Um, and I, I think that I chose this question because it's a, it is an interesting space and in that you have a lot of, you do have some foot traffic. You have people going, um, walking to the Greenway. You, you do have a lot of people driving. Um, you've got cyclists, you know, and with that incoming bike lane, you'll have more. So I think this question is sort of getting at um, how, you know, how viewers are gonna experience this. I think another helpful question, like, is there an existing piece of public art or art in Charlotte that you have, like, or have had an experience with that you found kind of moving or, you know, uh, Trey, you mentioned murals earlier, like, is there, you know, what is it about murals or what is it about art and potential art that Matt's going to create in this area that could enrich your day-to-day -day experience? I don't mind answering. Uh, this is Jordan. I feel like I'm taking up a lot of space and I do apologize. Don't apologize, um, Jordan. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, for me, it's just a matter of uh, breaking up what we typically see. Like there's a lot of development happening. A lot of that development is tan and brown. It's very banal at this point. Um, and so... For me, how I like to experience art is like something that's unexpected. Um, something that no matter how many times I come across it, I, I still take a moment and have an appreciation for it. And I'm hoping that's 
kind of what we're going to be getting with um, your work, man. I'll do my best. Thank you. I, I would say the same thing. Again, I <clears throat> used to live in the university area, but now I live in Steel Creek, and there is a piece of public art um, on the corner of Westinghouse and South Tryon, and that's one, um, you know, piece of public art that that we that is very seen there. And so, whenever I'm driving, I always just appreciate the beauty and that we have something, um, you know, public art in, in our community. And that kind of reflects the community. And to what Jordan said, you know, when you, when you pass by it, you just, it's something beautiful to look at um, and you can connect with it because it's, it's in your neighborhood and, and where you live. And I like murals and all, but I'm glad you're a sculptor. <laughs> <laughs> either way yeah well, thank you Krista. why not both yeah i think there's something to be said for uh you know interactive art too um i don't know if you guys remember um uh bricks pizza um uptown they used to be like this uh this column type thing where you would touch it and it would light up and it would make sounds. You guys remember that? Yeah, it's still there. Yeah. Is it is is it still yeah. functioning? <laughs> well, it, yeah, yeah, it doesn't seem like it. Oh, okay. I I know once the pandemic happened, then you know, it wasn't a whole lot of people uptown. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think there's a lot to be said about art that's sort of interactive that you can touch and and um you know, that type of thing. So um, I would like to see that type of art too. Thank you, Trick. Do you have any other questions, Matt? Let me move on. Yeah, I think I got one more. Krista, I did not know that that piece was called Touch My Building. And that's, uh, thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. Yep. <laughs> Uh, so this is maybe another way to ask that question, but what is a meaningful outcome here? Um, and maybe we've sort of been tiptoeing around this answer, but does anybody have, does anything come to mind when people see this question? And um, just very um, quickly, Matt, I believe uh, um, the Limerick um, were responding to your last question when they had type in um, sculpture that makes music or sounds in the wind. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that, Lim Kirks. This sounds a little silly, but I think a meaningful outcome, you know, you know, it doesn't sound silly. A meaningful outcome would be if there is a draw to the piece. If, um, you know, we see with like the rail trail and the mural, um, uh, the murals all south of us, how um, people flock to those, um, whether it's taking selfies or actually to uh, enjoy and view it. Um, I, I think it having some sort of mass appeal that brings people to it would be very meaningful. I agree. I think that would be a great outcome. And I think it's well suited even for the site, with it being along a greenway. Mm -hmm. As people mentioned earlier, the, the lake or the pond already serves kind of as a semi-natural landmark. So mm -hmm. put it in a destination place or like a place a respite, a stopping place would be really beneficial to the area. And yeah, I'd I love to, for it to kick off. Oh, I'm sorry. No, please go ahead, Jordan. I'd love for that to kick off other public art pieces. Like let this be the one that the city is like, okay, let's invest those funds and bring more of this to University City. 
Yeah, I see in the chat that Krista said um, sense of pride, and I I like that a lot. I think that it's been said a variety of ways, um, but you know, people aren't always super proud to say that they live in the university area. I would like them to be. It's it's great, you know, but we we could use a little help, and uh, yeah, I hope I can. I hope I can help with that. That would be amazing. Um, I'm also happy to just open this up if anybody has things they want to talk about uh, yeah thanks, crazy ideas. I was about to do the same thing mm -hmm. especially if you guys have any questions either of Matt or myself um, you know about this project Matt and the great work he showed uh, ASC the Royal Public Art Program we have about nine minutes remaining for tonight's meeting, so I'd be happy to answer any of those. Or any crazy ideas you have. Crazy ideas are appreciated. We'll take this down to you. I have a question, Matt. Um, mm -hmm. Is there any research being done, for example, at UNC Charlotte about, or I don't know whether it was Tom Hanchett to learn more about the history in, in that area more along the Greenway? He is on my list. I would, okay. I would like to talk to him. Um, I worked on a project a few years ago and got pretty close to getting in contact with him because I had some questions about some Charlotte history and also, in all signs point to Tom. I mean, everybody tells you he's the guy. So, uh, yes, that is uh, that will happen. Because I I've done you know I've dipped my toe into like kind of researching this area. I really haven't found a whole lot, um, and I don't I don't think that this area doesn't have history. I think that it's just it's been buried a little bit. And I didn't really show any work regarding that, but um, that's part of my practice is is looking into sites. And um, we didn't really talk about public art philosophy either, but um, it's vital to me that this is appropriate for this space. I think public art is inherently site-specific art. Um, and what I don't want to do is just plop down some cool idea I have into a space that doesn't make any sense. Um, so if you take anything away from this meeting, take that away. I mean, I, I am approaching this with care. Matt, I'm wondering, are you engaging any of the college of arts and architecture students in this or any students from the CMS schools that are in the university city footprint? So I actually work for UNCC and I work in the art department. Um, I work in the, in the galleries for the university. So we have three galleries. And uh, even a couple of the projects I've, I showed earlier, um, I do a lot of stuff in collaboration uh, specifically with the College of Architecture. So uh, they will be engaged in what way, I'm not sure. Um, but absolutely, they're such an amazing resource and they've been a uh, big help for me through the years. But I would love to get some students involved. That's a tricky thing to do when you okay. want to make something permanent. Um, but I think that there's definitely uh, a valuable way to do that in terms of what the students are taking from it and what, you know, we end up with as residents of the neighborhood. I have one more question, Matt. Um, what would you say is the key thing that you need from community to help you be successful as you create this, this work? Mm. That's a great question. Um, you know, tonight I really was hoping to get a little bit of, of history and that didn't need to be like, you know, textbook history, but like person, some personal history. Um, and I can continue to seek that out, and I will. Uh, but that, to me, I think is probably the most valuable thing I can get from this community. 
Okay, thank you. I was just thinking of people that I know in university of how they can connect with you, Todd, Randella, you know, to, to share more post, um, post tonight's okay. event. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point, Krista. I mean, this conversation doesn't end tonight. Um, by any means, please reach out to myself or Randella if you have like, if it's a thought, a question, you know, uh, we're always here and willing to listen and, you know, help however we can. If there's no other questions or comments, I just wanna say thanks, Matt. This has uh, been really great. Um, you're amazing, your work's amazing. We're lucky to have you working on this project. And I, for one, am super excited as to what you're gonna do. Um, and we're along for the ride with you, so. Oh, thank you, Todd, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm really honored to be, to have been selected and to do this and, and thank you all for your time tonight. I really appreciate you hopping on and 